Oh, good evening. You could have called me for the carpets. I'm very, I, I, you, you know what a white hat is? The guy, the foreman? I just, I like to look. I like to watch, observe. That's all I can do. Good to have, uh, have been invited to uh, speak tonight. And I pray, oh God, that uh, he would just bless our time together. And that we'd have a good time for everyone, even young, uh, even the children, that uh, that they would uh, be uh, would have a blessed time. So let's go to James chapter three, James chapter three, and this is sort of the theme uh, that we want to look at. We'll try and weave this in as we go through. the family, James chapter 3 and verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing will be there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. But the wisdom that is from above is pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. I really want you guys to meditate on this. Meditate on that verse 17, but the wisdom from above. Now, turn with me to Hebrews and just go back a little bit. Hebrews chapter 11, I want to read verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Psalm 127. Psalm 127. I know this is mostly familiar to most of you, but... It's always good, isn't it, to read the Word of God? It's always good to look down, isn't it? And look in your Bible and just read the Word of God, this supernatural book that we have. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now the serpent. And I would just want to stop there. Now the serpent. Heavenly Father, we... 
thank you again, O oh God, as we come together, Father. We thank you for uh, your blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Father. We want to honor him this weekend. And even as our dear brother mentioned, the family is close to you, Father. The family. Lord, your design. And Father, we pray, O oh God, that we would exalt the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, stir our hearts. And we realize that we're in a spiritual battle, O oh God, for the very home, our homes. And Father, we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Okay. So what we're going to do, and this will probably take two sessions, and then the second, I, I'm, a, I'm a guy that likes bullets, okay? So I want to talk to you, and I like I said, I don't know how far I'll get. Ten, okay? Ten must of child raising. We're going to do that tonight, probably tomorrow morning, first session. And then we're going to look at the 10 must of a godly marriage. And so this is for everyone, okay? This is for everyone. And I, I think there's nothing closer to God's heart than his assembly, and as our brother mentioned, the health of the family the spiritual well-being of the family. So, point number one. Like I said, I'm a bullet guy. That's how I, I learn, and uh, I just I like to keep things short and sweet. Um, bullet point number one. Goals. Goals. Ten must of ch uh, child raising goals a failure to plan in a family is a failure to succeed planning what is your goal god honors goals visualize parents visualize into the future now I understand some of you are at different stages here, but I'm not, I'm not talking about Eastern religion in visualization. I mean, literally, it's a good thing to look down the road and to see and to plan. You have a target. The Bible says that your kids are like arrows in a quiver and as you pull the arrow out and you aim at that target you are visualizing a, su a successful young boy or girl turning into a man or a woman of God God honors those prayers God honors that type of planning goals I I was saved first. I got saved on a Thursday night. And Sunday morning. Because of the one connection that I had. He was involved in an assembly. He actually was an elder. Even though he was a very young man. In an assembly in northern Ontario. And on Sunday morning. I got saved in his basement on Thursday night. And he said Tony. Sunday morning, we have church, and, you know, like, I'm brand new Christian. I've never been into an evangelical church. I've never been into a Protestant church in my life. And I said, I will be there, and I talked my wife into it because I told her that um, she didn't understand what I was saying, never went to church, so why are you going to church? But I said, "Hun, we're going to go out for dinner after, Okay. And uh, we had four kids. They were all young. And we never really, I can't say that we probably never went to the restaurant, uh, you know, with four kids. Uh, but my wife was all in. Okay? Now, I tell you that God put in my heart. 
I was a baby in the Lord, a day or two in the Lord, and I knew that the right place for my children was at the assembly. The right place for my kids was in Sunday school. I never went to Sunday school in my life, but I knew God put it in my heart that I was to be the leader in my home spiritually. My wife wasn't even safe. She didn't even know what I was talking about. But I knew that I, I had to be like Noah, preparing an ark for his household. Preparing an ark. Think of the man of Gadarenes. Go to Mark's Gospel in chapter 5 in your mind. You probably can see it in your mind. You've read it before. Here he is, a legion of demons. How many was that? 600? 1,000? <laughs> he was in bad shape. True or false? Yeah, bad. Right? And you can imagine. He, he, he cut himself and nobody could... Nobody could contain this man, and he was a wild donkey of a man. And the Lord saves him. What does he say? Lord, I want to follow you. Hey, I'm, I'm coming. Can you can imagine, right? But what did the Lord say? Go home. Christian, listen. God's will for your life. Do I got to go over, maybe go back to India or whatever and be a missionary? Maybe, but that's not your primary calling. That is not your primary calling. Your primary calling is your home. Go home. Make that right. Tell your kids, the family, that's what God's plan is for your life. If that's wonderful and, 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 and God has called you out of maybe this country and you're going to be a missionary somewhere, hey, I, 100%. I, I, you know, I always felt guilty when people like missionaries would come, even from India or whatever. I, I had nothing but admiration for them. And I go, Lord, send me if you want to send me. No, I don't like snakes, though, okay? So you can send me, but... You know what I mean? Like, I'm a little bit of a baby. So, but you know what? I, I realize that God wants me to go home. God wanted me to go home. God wanted me to be a godly man in my home. That was his will for my life. Goals, number one. Mommy and daddy must be on the same page. Now, I could give you, you see, I've been around for 38 years. I used to do a lot of, ask Brother Thomas. I used to do a lot of preaching to young people. I guess I'm, you know, I guess I'm too old. They never invite me anymore, well, hardly, okay? I, I did the circuit, you name it, <laughs> from Houston to Dallas to Columbus to you name it all over the place, all across Canada and whatever, youth, the youth, the youth, the youth, the youth. And now I'm too old, I guess. I still love the youth. But I'm going to say something. Number two, point number two, mommy and daddy be on the same page. Because I could give you case history after case history after case history. And I've seen it on both sides. Daddy wants to put his foot down. Ladies, look at me, please. I can still see you through your mask. And mommy undoes it. Are you looking? Or I've seen it the other way. Mommy, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the father is the pussycat. The father will not stick with his wife when it comes to raising their children 
for the things of the Lord. Satan's plan, and that's why I, I, and we'll touch on this tomorrow when we talk about marriage, but isn't it interesting in Genesis chapter 2, when it talks about the first marriage, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, right in Genesis 2, and then right in, where does, where does Satan come in? Into the picture, right after the marriage. Coming to a theater near you. Satan. Who hates you. Hates your family. Is after your family. He will see to it. Mommy and daddy must be on the same page. On the same page. Now you can imagine at first I got saved. Rosie, you know, it took her two years. It took her two years because you know what she kept saying to me? You needed that. I don't need it. You know, she didn't see her need. She wasn't like me. But the Lord worked on her. And finally, one it's, it, this is a true story, by the way. Uh, in a September, maybe about a year and a half, well, it's almost two years after I got saved. Uh, I, it was, I can still remember, I think it was September 6th or 7th. And you're looking back at probably 1984. And the Lord, you, you ever had the Lord speak to you? Well, I didn't hear no audible uh, Lord, but I was reading 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and the Lord spoke to me. You know what he said? Shut up. Yeah. Tony, shut up. Quit preaching to your wife. See, I couldn't understand what was holding her back. You know, I said, hun. I looked into it. I studied it. I counted the cost. I read the Gospel of John. I, you, you, we all need to be saved. And my wife keep looking at me, and then the Lord told me, Tony, shut up. Live it. Live it. Love her up. Quit preaching. Leave the, sa leave the salvation to me. <laughs> it wasn't, I think it was a month later. You ever hear the name Joe Reese? Joe Reese is a tremendous... A uh, southern drawl preacher who actually lived up in northern Ontario. I don't know how he got up there. But he came and did a, a conference in our little assembly in Timmins, Ontario. Okay? Santa Claus? Timmins. Okay? Uh, anyway, and, and my wife liked it. Actually, I even got my mother to come out. To listen to the, the messages on the family. And it was such a good speaker. And of course, my wife, she liked that. And, I, you know, I, you know, the Lord told me to shut up. But didn't tell me I couldn't plan some stuff. So I had Joe Reese come over to our house for a coffee after the meeting. And uh, he came in and... Uh, you know, my wife was, was excited because he was, he was a good speaker and he spoke on the family and talked about teenagers and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and he, you know, Joe didn't even get the first cookie down. And he said to my wife, Rosie, are you saved? I, I was sweating as it were great drops of blood. Okay, like, I mean, I'm sitting there going, oh, this is either going to make it or break it. And my wife is soft as butter, said Joe. No, I'm not. And he said, well, what is holding you back? Do you believe the gospel? Do you believe that you're a sinner? And he, in such a gentle little way, he brought her to, and she, she, was, she surrendered right on the spot. And I'll tell you, a few, a few years later, the Lord was already using me as preaching the gospel. And one day I was on my way home and just talking to the Lord, you know, on a, the, the only thing between Cochrane, Ontario, Canada, and Timmins, Ontario, Canada, about an hour drive, are moose. There are no people. And I was driving home, and again, you know, the Lord just, Tony, you need to take leadership in your home. 
And I went home that day and I was stirring and, you know, we were talking and then, you know, we're outside and whatever. And then I finally said, hun, can I talk to you, please? And we sat down. I said, hun, I got to tell you something. I have not been the husband that I should be. And I have not been the father that I should be. And I want, to, I want your help so that I can be uh, the man that I should be of God. And I want you to, to um, promise me you'll hold me accountable to that and that you and I will sing from the same song sheet. I tell you, it was the, one of the best conversations I ever had with my wife at the time. And you know what? It was all of the Lord. Mom and dad must be on the same page. Mom and dad must be on the same page. Number three, parents must set the example. You know what, kids? Kids, I'll tell you something that I've learned about kids. They have the best internal baloney detector that you've ever met. True or false? It's true, isn't it? Kids can read you a mile away. So, Daddy, Daddy, if you are inconsistent, oh, you're not, yeah, Daddy, uh, if you are inconsistent, your kids will figure you out. They know you can talk a big game, Christianity, but you better live the game. Do you know what I'm saying? Because you need to be an example to kids. Christianity is shoe leather. It's shoe leather. You walk the walk, and the kids know it. And parents, you got to be together when you say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Daddy can't be so busy bringing home the bacon and today <laughs> the message has changed now because you know even to have a home generally you almost for sure need two incomes. True or false in South Florida? Eh, probably true isn't it? You know, so it's a different dynamic. But at the end of the day, God wants you to honor him. And, and your career cannot be more important than the spiritual bringing up of those children. And if you, you make it a priority, your kids will see the inconsistency in that. The assembly is a wonderful thing, guys. It really is. And we need each other. We need fellowship with each other. We need encouragement with one another. And do not forsake the assembling of one another, as is the custom of some. But I'm going to tell you something. Your home, your home is the primary place that you, you, you model the person of Jesus Christ. You're an ambassador for Christ in your home first. Teach your kids, number four, teach your kids theology. Teach them. Don't wait for Sunday school here to teach them theology. I think that this is very important. You need to form a child's worldview. The world is like gravity. It's going to constantly pull at your kids. It will never stop, guys, because the God of this world, right? 1 John 5 and 19 the God of this world will never let gravity stop to pull your kids into its mold to conform your children to the world. You need to teach them, parents, a Christian worldview. 
that they understand at a very young age, the world is a very poor home, but it's a great school. What happens when you're in school? You're tested. Don't be surprised by that. That's what school is all about. The world for a Christian is a school. You haven't graduated yet. You're still here. And children need to get a worldview. Teach them that there is an invisible enemy. Teach them that the enemy of their souls, make them understand that. Kids are smart. You, you'd be surprised. They're like little sponges. Teach them. You know, it says in Deuteronomy 6, right? Day and night and night and day. Talk. Talk the Lord at home. Talk testimonies you hear a good testimony share it parents share it with your kids share it with your kids teach them a biblical worldview where do they come from where do they come from you know what the world out there i, I might have mentioned this the last time i was here i think i did with the young people when i was here uh maybe about a month ago or when was it that's and i can't remember exactly a month about that, right? Anyway, I'm old, I forget. But um, the, the biggest problem in young people today, in, you know, I, I, I do a podcast, so I, every day I, I'm talking, you know, different things about health, but one of the things I've been re repeating often is the, uh, you know, our brother said it uh, tonight, the unintended consequences of this pandemic. It was unintended. You know, every doctor in the world never wants people to get sick, right? But the problem is, and I, I, I've been a little bit critical, is that when we're looking only at a virus, we're, we're forgetting the mental health. Uh, I think our brother would know this because it's, 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 it's been in the news is that people are delaying cancer treatment because... I know my son-in-law is an emergency physician, and uh, it wasn't long ago that someone came in and uh, he was in uh, acute uh, cardiac uh, arrest, and uh, Sam tried to save him, and uh, was too late. He couldn't, re he couldn't revive him. And, of course, the wife couldn't even come in. She's out in the car outside emergency, he's dead. Sam's got to go and, you know, who is, who's his wife and where is it? And, okay, who do I talk to? Anyways, unintended consequences. She can't even enter the hospital. She goes out and he, Sam talks to her and uh, she, he said, well, tell, you know, he had to tell her that her husband, he was only 54, I think, or 55. She, she, she couldn't believe it. And I, Sam, you know, after consoling her a bit, he said, can you tell me a little, did he have any symptoms? Or Well, he said, you know, his leg was about this big yesterday. And I tried to get him to come to emergency, but he wouldn't come. He was scared of COVID. He had a blood clot that went up into his lungs and then uh, heart. And, uh, but all I'm saying is, guys, uh, the, uh, you, you have, you know what's happening in our hometown, okay? And this is right across Canada, by the way. Suicide is, suicide's always been bad. Overdoses are unbelievable. You see, I got a, a degree in obituaryology, okay? You know what that is? Every morning I check the obituaries, not here, but in my hometown make sure first of all i'm not in there right and secondly i look and see who's there it's amazing how many patients or how many people when you've been in practice as long as me i know a lot of people and every day 
But it's amazing to me because I show Rosie. said, yeah, I already gave you your honorary degree. Do I have to listen? To I said, no, but look. Look at the age of this person. In since March, since March, a year now, almost to the day, right? The, in Sudbury, which is a city of about 140,000 people, there has been average since March of 2020, 20, 2020, 30 deaths a month, one every day. And you see it because you can't miss it. It's a young person who's in the obituaries. You know what, my friend? I'm going to tell you something. And that's, of course, an unintended consequence. I'm not saying because it's, there's always been suicide, but now it's double. It's double. Because people are supposed to be with people. Right? I mean, we're supposed to be with each other. And we need each other. Do you know what kids need? Kids need. But what I'm saying is, the world out there, they don't even know where they came from. Christian, you teach those kids. Where do they come from? Because... I don't know if you will homeschool them, but they're going to learn it anyways. If they get to a higher institution, I can tell you, I was indoctrinated with evolution. I was indoctrinated, especially in the sciences. Evolution, evolution, and it's just, it's science. Follow it. And if my professor said it, must be true. I never even questioned it because it's science. Right? I tell you the ramifications of evolutionary teaching has been a disaster, especially on young people. They don't know where they came from. They don't know why they're here. They don't know where they're going. And who cares? Right? That's a great question. Who cares? And it seems like the young people, especially in this pandemic, children, especially in this pandemic, have been kicked to the side. I've never seen a generation my age that is more concerned about me than my grandchildren. It's crazy. But parent, you need to beware. Where are your kids? Teach them theology, that God cares, that they're in a world that hates them. Teach them. Teach them. Show them. Con number five, constantly check their spiritual temperatures. Parents, I could give you case history. After case history, after case history of the last people who knew about the drug use of their children in the Christian, in the assembly, was the parents. As an elder, I found out before the parents knew. You have no idea, Christian, how many times I was in the prison ministry for 35 years. And how many times I went to the prison to visit young men who were brought up in a Christian home that were now incarcerated. And they had godly parents at home but parents who buried their head in the sand. Oh, not my little Johnny. He would never do that. I tell you guys, when that little baby comes out, remember one thing, the Bible is true. He's a potential juvenile delinquent. True or false? True, because that's, that's a biblical worldview. You know what? I love what uh, President Reagan used to say. Trust, but verify. 
You know, parents don't want to verify anymore. You know, I, what, are you a lawyer? You're going to negotiate? I used to tell my kids, hey, do you eat here? Yep. Do you sleep here? Yep. Okay, well, then uh, you do what I tell you to do. Because uh, you eat here and sleep. The day you don't eat here anymore, and you can buy your own food, and you don't sleep here anymore because you got your own bed and your own place, then Daddy won't bug you. But today, I bug you. Why? I'm the boss. Yeah. And Mommy's right behind me. And my mom, my mom, my wife, Rosie, she, she's tiny, but oh, can she pack a punch. <laughs> I, oh, she's an Italian stallion. You be careful. I married the mafia's daughter, okay? My wife. Now, she's going to come on the weekend. You be nice, okay? You be nice. But, guys, listen. Every child is different. Some are low maintenance. I was a low maintenance child. Now, if you believe that, I got some swamp land. In Florida, I'd like you to sell you. I was a very high maintenance kid, okay? Um, but you know, but some kids are like I, I have four kids, right? Four, well, all adults now. My baby's forty-one. But you know what? I, I look at them. We're all different, you know. And and I thank God, in even in spite of 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 this Frenchman here being very stubborn. But I thank God for my wife who 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 knew like a good nurse to how to take the temperature of the kids, not physically, but spiritually. My wife was so good at it. And you know what? I got her to open up to me. Hun, trust me. I want to have my kids back, but I need information that you have that I don't have. You know what I mean? I need the information. <laughs> you want to be a good FBI agent? You better ask questions. Okay? Questions. And... I, you know, I, it's not that they wouldn't, kids wouldn't communicate with me, but not like they would with Mama. And Mama used to have, uh, her and I had many, 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 many discussions. And we would go out on a date every Friday night, and we'll talk about that. You better be doing that, you cheapo men, you. <laughs> Get out and go on a date. Anyway. We did that. We still do it. Friday night, my wife and I. Friday night, my kids. You know, you have to remember, there was no cell phones in those days, okay? And we would go to this Chinese place, and they were patients of mine, you know? George. And uh, George would, you know, he, little Chinaman, you know, he'd run to the table. Dr. Martin, the phone. I knew what it was, the kids. They were checking. They knew where we were. We couldn't even hide. We were having Chinese food on a Friday night. And my kids, they actually would protect that. No, don't try and call my dad. He's, he's out with mom. You just never mind. They're dating. These kids like that. They think it's corny, but they kind of, they like it, right? They want mommy and daddy to romance. And Friday nights, but you know, the, the biggest thing on Friday nights is my wife would debrief me on the kids. You know, Tony Jr.'s this, and Leslie's that, and Stacy's this, and got this problem, and this happened, and and uh, Tiffany is like this, and 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 you know what? Um, constantly check the spiritual temperature of your children. Number six. Control the playground. Listen, mommy and daddy. Control the playground and the friends. You want permission? I just gave it to you. It's your absolute duty. Again, ask for wisdom. Ask for discernment. You get to choose their friends. This is why an assembly is so wonderful. You've got young families here. These kids, their best friends should be here. Should be here. But you get to choose that. You get to choose that. I don't know if I told you the story or not, but on uh, my, I preached at my mother's funeral and uh, in our hometown, and 
My mom was, my parent, my dad was very well known, and my mom too, in a small community you can imagine, and I got saved, and I, I led my mom to the Lord on her deathbed. She told me when I first shared Christ with her, don't you ever talk to me about that again, ever. And my mother, when she said something, I was never scared of my dad, but oh boy, did I have a healthy fear of my mother. Okay? And I mean that. Still to this day, I, mom is looking at me the wrong way. Oh, you're in, you're in trouble. But you know what? I, 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 was, I was, you can imagine, full of emotion. And it was, you know, I was preaching. There was 500 people in a Catholic church. And I was, you know, the priest the night before at the, at the funeral home, he, he, he did this to me, you know, and he intimidated me. You keep it short. And I don't want to hear none of your uh, Bible talk, he said. So that, that, that intimidated me until, I, until God spoke to me again. What's he going to do, pull me off the pulpit? He couldn't do it. And I preached the gospel. But you know what? That morning, I took my son. We went for a ride. I said, Tony Jr., I need to talk to you. He was just going to university, 17 or 18. And... Um, there was a girl coming to the youth group, and, you know, we invited, I'll tell you, you know, we used to get 80 or 90 children, not children, youth, on a Saturday night in Timmins, Ontario. They were all in high school together, and, you know, my, my four were all in high school at, at the same time, and there was other families, and they were all in the high school, and they would invite their friends to come Saturday night, so we had... You know, 70, 80 kids. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that? And, and a lot of them got saved. But there was this young girl, and she, you know, she kind of liked my son. And, you know, I, listen, she wasn't a bad girl. Don't get me wrong at all, okay? But I just felt that my son was not mature enough or whatever. I just said, no, nah, Tony, listen, I, I, I want you to marry uh, someone like your mom, Okay. And I'm not saying this girl will never be that. I'm just saying right now, I don't see it. And I'm going to ask you to do something. And I said, I got a big day coming up with, you know, burying my mom. And I'm preaching the, the gospel at my mom's funeral. But I said, son, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you, no, I don't want you to see her again. And your mother and I have talked about this. And I want you to honor your father and mom by doing this. And I, not, I didn't say it was going to be easy, but I tell you, I want you to do it. Anyway, after the funeral, and, you know, it was an emotional time, and I, they were talking to people, you know, on the way out of the church, and, that, and my son grabbed me, and he put his arms around me, and he cried like a baby, and he said, Dad, I already did what you asked me to do. And, you know... Parents, listen to me. One of the most difficult things you'll do is you get to choose your children's friends. That's not an easy thing to do, but it's an absolute necessity. Can you think, think about this for a minute. You know, I often think of this example in Scripture. What was Lot thinking? What was Lot thinking? Here he is in fellowship with his uncle. And you can be sure when they got around the fire, they were talking about the Lord and the things of the Lord and, and the wonderful things. And Lot one day, what got over him? He had Egypt on his mind and he, and he, he, he looked down the road and he, and he made a choice. And, you know, because Abraham said, well, you choose. What was Lot thinking when he headed off to Sodom? What was he thinking? And Christian, be careful. We live in Sodom. True or false? We live in this world. It's just like it. It's so difficult. Be careful of the decisions that you make. You know, maybe you got a you get a, a a job and it 
calls you to go out of town and 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 you know it's uh uh it, it's a wonderful maybe opportunity uh cash wise or whatever and you know but you're you're thinking about you but do you think about the healthy assembly that that you have here people that love you people that care for you people that watch over you people that keep you accountable And you leave, and that, you know, I'm not saying that God can't be part of that. Of course he can. But you need to take that into consideration. I tell you, in 1999, so I had already been speaking, Brother Thomas, uh, in New York and other places, I got an offer to be a consultant to, well, they were a pharmaceutical company, but they were coming in to Canada with a nutraceutical, like a supplement or a vitamin, and it was brand new, and they wanted me to be their spokesman. And uh, when I went home with, to talk to my wife about it, it was, you know, listen, I'd already been in practice 25 years. It was a chance to move to Montreal to go to a big city, and they were going to pay for this, they were going to pay for that, and pay, and uh, big money, and I, I, my wife, you know, like, she said, hon, I think it would be fun. It was a disaster. The elders came to pray over me. I was an elder before you know, maybe a month or so, it was a fast transition. I had to make up my mind quickly and then head uh, for Montreal in a, in a little town that, you know, on a bad day, it would take me four minutes to get home if I missed the light. And uh, it would take me four minutes to get out of, just to get out of our parking lot in Montreal and then, uh, you know, an hour on a good day to get down to the office. It was a disaster. Spiritually, it was a disaster. Those elders had come to me and said, Tony, we beg you not to take that job. The door should have been closed for Tony, but Tony kicked it open. Oh, did I ever get a spanking from God in Montreal? I, I, I couldn't tell you half of it. Half of it left a healthy assembly and made a, 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 a terrible choice, and we can do that. Parents, you have every right. Listen to what I'm going to say. You see the phone? If your kid's got a phone, there's nothing you can't go look at. So if you are like me, uh, technologically challenged, my wife's much better. Nothing is private with your children. Nothing. You're the FBI. And you better not lie to the FBI. That's a felony. True or false? It's true. You're the FBI. You get to look at the phones. You look a day at the computer. You get to check their playground. A hundred percent. And if you don't do it, it's because you're burying your head in the sand. They live under your roof. They follow your rules. And even if they don't feel like it, then they kick up a fuss. Too bad. So sad. Your dad. We don't negotiate certain things. I'm giving you a privilege. It's a phone. It's a privilege. That privilege can be taken away instantly, without negotiations. I want to see who you're talking to. I want to see what you're looking at. I tell you I could give you case history after case history of young men. Oh, there's a blood test for this, by the way. Brother Thomas knows his blood test. Men, prick your finger. If it comes out red, you got problems with this. 
Okay? So you can't, your little eyeballs need to be protected. Got it? And if you don't have red blood, don't worry about it. It's not for you. Okay? But if you got red blood, this is for you, men. And mummy, you looking? Mummy, looky. See? I'm looking. Look. Oh, little Johnny would never do that. Yes, he would. He's, he's got the sin nature, and Satan knows exactly his or her weaknesses and will exploit them a hundred percent. Now, this might be tough talk, but this is coming from a a father and a grandfather and a great-grandfather, and I tell you as an elder, I have seen it all. You know what the problem with being an elder is? I know too much. I know too much. I know too much about marriages. I know too much about homes. Where the, one of the kids has gone off and, uh, like, your God is not my God. Has that ever, do you have any examples of that? Where young people, do you got any examples of that? You know what? I, I'm going to tell you something. I was here about a month ago. Our, our dear brother invited me to come. I love youth group. I do. I, I love kids. But uh, there wasn't that many kids here. Now, was that because I was speaking? I didn't ask. But if a, you know, it was, uh, was it a Friday or a Saturday? I don't remember. Friday night. Why weren't you here if you're a kid? I'm asking a good question. Why weren't you here? The doors were open. The elders decided that there should be a young people's meeting. Then why weren't uh, some of the young people here? I'm going to ask the question. Listen, I'm not, into, uh, I'm not into numbers, guys. I'm not into numbers. And you know what? You never have to invite me again. That's what's nice about having a speaker from out of town, right? I'm going back to Canada, if they ever let me back. No, but listen. There was, I, I think there was young people that weren't here. Why? Oh, yeah, but Johnny, you know, he, uh, you know, Johnny, you, you, you don't realize that, you know, he, he gets tension headaches uh, if you yell at him. Ooh. And, you know, with Johnny, yeah, well, Johnny's got to get an education, but, you know, Sunday school, well, that's more like optional. Ooh. You have no idea how many cases I could tell you about. I'm a case history guy. I could give you case history after case history where that has been uh, that kind of negotiations with kids is a disaster waiting to happen. A disaster waiting to happen. I'm going to stop there. Tomorrow we'll continue, okay? And we're going to have uh, 10 points of a healthy marriage. So number, tonight we got to number six, I think, okay? Parents, look, I, I think you know enough about me right now to know that uh, I can be harsh at times. But I want to tell you that in this heart here is butter. I, I am hypersensitive to the difficulties in a home. Hypersensitive to it. And I understand it and I see it. And if I can give any guidance at all, anything that I've said tonight that maybe resonates with you, then don't take it personally in that sense where I was trying to offend. I'm not trying to offend. I'm trying to provoke unto love and to good works. That's I, all I want for you is that you 
um, you raise your children for as uh, uh, as champions for Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, O God, for this day, and I thank you for these precious folks, Lord, and I, I pray, O God, in every home that's represented here tonight, Lord, would you um, speak to their hearts, Father, if it, needs to, if it needs to be spoken to. I pray for mom and dad and brothers and sisters and uh, Father, the siblings, we know the family unit, oh God, is under attack today, like never before, really. And yet, Father, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We know that. You're victorious, oh Father, and we pray and speak victory over every home in this assembly. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.